Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. Good morning, ma. Good morning. Success, could you Success, please, uh, please uh, switch off your, switch off your mute your uh, this one, please? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you this morning and hope you all had a good um, weekend. Yes. Rested well, all of you? Or was it a busy weekend with church activities? No response? Ma'am, it was a busy weekend with church activities. <laughs> okay. Oh, so your uh, church is, uh, I mean, you're a meeting in person? No, ma'am. We are engaged in online now. Okay. 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 Thank you, Isaac. Your weekend was good. Okay. Before we begin class today, can uh, somebody lead us in prayer, please? Yeah, go ahead. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Thank you for this day. You have given us, Lord, this the fresh week, Lord. You have given us, Lord, as we are going to learn from your word, Lord. Whatever we are going to learn from your word, Lord, let it should abide in our heart, Lord. Lord, give us your fear and knowledge, Lord. In Proverbs, it is written, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Lord. Lord, we need your fear from through that fear, we can understand this knowledge, Lord. Whatever you are giving to us, Lord, whatever you are teaching to us, Lord, it should be used for your kingdom expansion and to be in all glory be given to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, before we begin chapter 3 today, we'll just uh, briefly do a, a quick recap of what we did last Monday. Anyone remembers what um, we looked at or what we studied last Monday? Who are we studying about in this course, Christology? That's an easy question. Who are we studying about in this course, Christology? Ma'am, in Christology, we are studying about Christ, who was equal man and equal God when he was in the earth. Okay, he was fully God and fully man. Thank you. Uh, so what did we look at in chapter 1 and chapter 2? What did we study? In chapter two, two. Okay, go ahead, Lubega. Sorry. In chapter two, we looked at, at the equality, the the equality of of Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit plus God the Father, pathology. Okay. So, what are we trying to prove? In what are we actually basically studying in uh, chapter one and chapter two? Yeah, in, in chapter one, we are, we are studying the pre-existence of Jesus Christ, according to the word of John, John 1, 1. Okay, thank you. And so what are we trying to prove by looking at the pre-existence of Jesus Christ, by looking at his equality with the Father and with the Holy Spirit? What are we trying to prove? What are we trying to prove by looking at uh, his pre-existence, Christ's pre-existence, and his equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit? What are we trying to prove? Yes, go ahead, Lubega. Okay. Okay. I think we are trying to prove that Jesus Christ existed even before his life, his, him, before his being born around the 4th B.C. Okay, so we are, what are we trying to prove? That before he exists, before he was born into this world, before he became incarnate, he existed, he existed even before the foundation of the world. So what are we trying to prove? And of course, he's God. Yes, thank you. We're looking at uh, this whole uh, aspect of him being deity, that means him being God. Yes, go ahead, Lubega. You raised your hand? No? Okay. 
Uh, so we're looking at uh, Jesus Christ, you know, him being God, deity. So in Christology, we're studying basically two aspects, uh, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And we're looking at how, you know, uh, 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 deity and humanity coexisted in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. So we are establishing the fact that he is God, not just that he is man who came down to this earth and, you know, uh, you know, um, existed in a certain period of time when he was born and when he died. But we're looking at his pre-existence and we are looking at his, the scripture verses that talk about his equality with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And thus we are establishing the fact that Jesus is God. Jesus is deity, okay, that he is divine, that he is um, God, okay. So that is what we looked at in chapters 1 and 2. We'll move on to chapter 2. Three, uh, where we look and study uh, Jesus's role in creation. And by doing so, we'll see that Christ is the creator, uh, which once again will prove uh, or will be proof that he is deity, okay, or he is God. So we look at uh, Christ's role in creation. Uh, did uh, Jesus have any role in creation? Yes, no. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like all of you to participate in class. Um, you know, it's okay if your answer is wrong. We are all learning. It really doesn't matter. Uh, so feel, please feel free to unmute your mics and uh, to answer. We are going to be looking at a lot of scripture passages. So I would request you to please get your Bibles, keep it in front of you. Or uh, you can open to your uh, the course content and all the scripture passages are there in bold. So you can read it out because we'll be reading out uh, the scripture passages. And I would like uh, a lot of class participation and involvement. I hope that's uh, okay with all of you because it's going to be then a, quite an engaging and an interesting class. Others are just going to keep on hearing my voice, which can be uh, boring for two hours. Okay. And I would also like to hear other voices and also lear uh, learn from you all. So please, you know, uh, share your opinions, your thoughts. And if you didn't don't understand anything, please feel free to answer. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Jesus Christ had a role in creation. So uh, what are the scripture verses? Uh, we looked at one, we studied one scripture verse both in Doctrinal Foundation and in uh, Christology, the first class. So which verse uh, or which chapter in the Bible talks about his role in creation? We studied this in John, the book of John. Chapter 1, verse yes. 1 and 2. Thank and you. Colossians also, Colossians 1, 6, 16 to 17. Thank you, uh, Ziotoli. And so we saw that in uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we were studying about uh, Jesus Christ being the Logos, um, you know, and thus being God. And we saw that, uh, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and uh, John is um, introducing um, Jesus as the Logos because of the uh, prevalent Jewish tradition that was there about this word Logos, the philosophers and what they were saying. So he's introducing Logos as God, as Jesus Christ. And he says, the word was with God and the word was God and he was in the beginning with God. But in verse three, he says, all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. Okay, so John reveals to us that all things were made through uh, Christ or all things were made through or by the word. And the word here is not the spoken word, but the person that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we also see another scripture reference where we look at uh, Jesus's role in creation. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. So can somebody read that please? Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 and 17. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether throne or dominion or principality or power. All things were created through him and for him, and 
he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Yes. So here we see that, uh, you know, we see these phrases, uh, all things were created by him, was created through him, was created for him, and in him all things consist. Okay. So here it says, for by him, who is the him that uh, uh, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae? Who is he referring to as him here? The person of Jesus. Yes, he's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay, um, so he's saying that all things, uh, which means all things we see in the natural, all things in the spiritual realm, were created by Christ. It was created through him, for him, and in him all things consist. Okay, so what we will look at these phrases created by him, created through him, created for him, and in him all things consist. What do we mean by this phrase, created by him? It's very simple. What do we mean by this phrase, created by him? It means he is the creator. Thank you. It's very simple. It just says that, you know, uh, he Jesus is the... Uh, creator. So here Paul is stating the fact that, uh, you know, Jesus is the creator and it's this is once again a proof of him being God, a proof of his deity. Okay, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, we see in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, and because he created uh, the heavens and earth, you know, he is uh God, and also he is worthy to receive all our glory, honor, and power, as it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. So can somebody read Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, please? Revelation 4, 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and you and by you and by your will they exist and we are created yes thank you so here we see that uh, uh, you know uh, god created all things and by his will they all exist and were uh, created and hence he deserves all the glory honor praise adoration uh, and the power because he alone is worthy so when we what do we mean by this phrase everything was created by him means he is creator which means he is god okay so the next phrase we look at is everything is created through him okay what do we mean by this phrase everything is created through him it's everything Let's go ahead, Abu Bakr. He's a meditator and he was in the entire process in creation. Okay, he created everything and he was there through the entire process of creation. Uh, yes, everything is created through him, which means he's a mediator of the entire process of creation. Uh, so we could see it this way that God the Father planned it, okay, we, we looked at it in the last class, that, Jesus, that God the Father is the one who conceives or plans his supreme authority, uh, and it is the, uh, and it's Jesus who, you know, who speaks, who brings about things, and it's the Holy Spirit who, you know, is, goes ahead and brings it about to pass. So we see that God the Father planned it, uh, Jesus spoke it and the Holy Spirit brought it to uh, pass. And this we read in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. So can somebody read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, please? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past, to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom 
also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thank you, Roslyn. So here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, it says that through him or through whom also he made the worlds, which means through whom here the whom is Jesus. So through Jesus also he made the worlds. And Hebrews 1, 3 continues to say that Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power. Okay, so uh, we also look at this fact that, you know, how how uh, in, in doctrinal foundation, we, when we talked about the power of God, we said that his word has power. Okay, his word is power. So when he speaks, whatever he speaks, whatever he declares, whatever he decreases, you know, it is yes and amen. It goes forth and it accomplishes, it achieves the purpose and the reason for which it is sent out through the mouth of um, God. Okay, so he, here we see that in his Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 that you know Jesus Christ the one who upholds all things and how does he do it through the power of his word okay the next phrase is everything is created for him which means the reason is a reason for all of creation uh, and all of creation will therefore serve him and the last phrase is in him all things consist what does it mean by saying when Paul says that in him all things consist. Any thoughts on that? In him all things consist. Ma'am, it means to me like he is the source and him and in him all things is existing. Okay, thank you. He is the source and in him all things uh, exist. Any other thoughts? I think he is life without him. Yes, go ahead, Lubega. He's life. I think he is life, and without him, nothing has life. Wonderful. Thank you. In him is life, and without him, you know, nothing can exist, nothing can have life. Yes, go ahead, Rosalind. Ma'am, it means everything is in his control. Okay, everything is in his control. Thank you. Um, Subhash said is he completes everything. Uh, yes. So uh, he's not only the source of creation, but he's somebody who also sustains creation. Okay. He's not only the giver of life, but in him, uh, all life exists. Or in, in him, everything moves and have their being like we read in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. So one of you can read. Uh, this verse from Acts chapter 17, verse 28, and some someone else can read from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Acts 17, what? 28, and 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yes, go ahead. Acts 17, 28. Acts 17, 28. For him, for in him, we live and move and have our being, as also some of you, some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Yes, so you look at the first uh, uh, bit uh, or part of this verse in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. It says, for in him we live, move, and have our being. That means without Christ, we do not have our existence. We cannot exist, cannot be sustained. We do not have life. First Corinthians 8, 6. First Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is one God. The Father of whom all are of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Thank you. Here we look at the latter half of this verse where it says, Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So we have our life, our being, our existence, a sustenance in Jesus Christ. He's not only the source of creation, but he also sustains um, creation. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 um, says that the entire universe is uh, held together by the power of his word. We just read that. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, upholding all things by the word of his 
power. So God's word is powerful. Uh, when he speaks, it comes into existence. It takes a shape. It takes its form. It comes into being. It's accomplished. Um, and uh, so that is why it's so important for us to know God's word, um, know the truths in God's word, so that when the devil, you know, plants a lie um, or tempts us uh, with twisting or turning the truth, uh, like he did for Adam and Eve, did God really say you shouldn't eat from this tree? If you eat from it, you will surely not die. So he tries to twist the truth. He tries to turn the truth. And so it's very important for us to be established in the truth of God's word. And also it's very important for us to know the promises in God's word. There are more than 3,000 promises in God's word. So if you want to live a life that is... Um, you know, it, it's effective, powerful, uh, a life that will help you overcome your challenges, the difficulties, um, uh, uh, difficult situations, then it's important for you to speak and declare God's word over every area of your life, whether it's your work, your family, your children, your spouse, your finances, um, you know, um, uh, uh, whatever your health um, you know, just speak and declare God's word because God's word is powerful. When you speak his word, you know, God is not a liar. He will not never go back on his word. He will never go back on his promises. Uh, it will be fulfilled. It will be accomplished. And you will see, uh, you know, the supernatural in the natural when you declare um, God's word. Okay. So here we see that creation also uh, reveals the glory of God. Okay, creation is like um, it's like a painting, it's like a picture that when we look at it, it just reveals the grandeur, the beauty, the uh, the perfection, the uh, the immense wisdom and knowledge and understanding of this uh, of this great, uh, big, mighty, and powerful God. Like the psalmist tells us in Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handy work. So when you look at creation, um, of course, you know, people have um, known God through creation. We also looked at, uh, we studied Romans chapter one, where it says, you know, Paul says, you know, those who do not believe in the existence of God cannot give an excuse because creation, you know, reveals um, the glory of God. It reveals the Godhead. It reveals the, the power of God. So men are without excuse. And uh, what should be our attitude when we look at creation? Not just that, yeah, there is a creator. Yes, he created everything in perfection. Uh, so great, uh, great God, awesome God, mighty God. I mean, that's one aspect of it, but that should lead us to worship him that should lead us to adore him that should lead us to just uh, glorify him and give him all the uh, glory because the heavens declare the glory of uh, god and so we see that the vastness of our universe uh, also indicates the glory of our creator god like the psalmist says in psalm chapter 147 Verse 4, he says, you know, uh, God counts the number of stars and he calls them each by uh, name. Okay. And the psalmist doesn't just stop there. He says, he doesn't just say, oh, wow, you know, God knows uh, uh, the number of stars in the sky. He knows them all by name. And um, yeah, he's God. So obviously he should know. Uh, that is not the way he ends it. But, you know, in verse 5, uh, it leads him to praise God. It leads him to worship God. It leads him to adore God. So in verse 5, we read, it says, the psalmist says, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is in finite. So even as the psalmist is dwelling on God's creation, looking at the grandeur, the beauty, uh, the in, uh, the uh, infinite wisdom which, which God had created it, it leads him uh, to worship God. It leads him to adore God. It leads him to praise him uh, for his, uh, for his um, greatness and his wisdom with which he's created all of uh, creation and here he, he says also that you know god is infinite uh, we already looked at what is the meaning of infinite when we studied in doctrinal foundations on friday uh, so we know that god is infinite that's one of his attributes he's so great 
uh, and his uh, authority over all creation, his dominant over all creation. And uh, this we read in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 and 13. So can somebody read Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 and 13, please? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12 and 13. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? Thank you. So here Isaiah is breaking out into like a poetry, um, and uh, he's just asking who can even measure the water in just the hollow of his hands, the entire water that's there in this universe, you know, or measure the heaven or calculated the dust of the earth and weighed the mountains. And he says, you know, it's none other than uh, God himself. So he's just talking about the grandeur, the greatness, uh, the power of God and, um, uh, you know, just praising him for who he is um, and, um, you know, that he's so infinite, he's so great, he's something that, you know, God, he's a God who we cannot even comprehend with our uh, human um, mind. So even as we are studying, you know, uh, about Christ, about his pre-existence, about his role in creation, um, even as we we study about uh, uh, God in, in, um, in doctrinal foundations, I mean, it should not be something that just becomes an academic exercise for us where we're just attending class we're just receiving knowledge but uh, it's it's my prayer that you know um, that all of us including me will take time to consider to read through um, uh, even as we are learning about God his nature his attributes his names his covenant names uh, uh, his deity his humanity and as the psalmist says um, you know in uh, Psalms chapter 8 verses 3 and 4 when I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have ordained, uh, you know, let us also consider, you know, let us look, let us ponder, let us meditate um, uh, on, on, on God, his works, his nature. And even as we do that, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, as we consider who God is, as we look at his works, his that he's the omnipotent creator, as we see in creation, as meditate on his on, on his nature, who he is and what he does, you know, we will begin to see his glory. Okay, we'll be able to see his glory, who he is, what he has done. Uh, we'll get a revelation of, uh, you know, the this infinite God who has revealed himself to us, who's revealing himself to us. And that should lead us uh, not to just uh, be excited about the revelations that we receive, but it's, it's uh, my prayer that all of us together, you know, uh, it will just lead us to worship him. Uh, for who he is, what he has done, worship him for his majesty, for his glory as it's reveal, revealed in creation. Um, like Paul says, and we already looked at this verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that men are without excuse. So even as we spend time studying, learning, and meditating on all who God is and his work, as we see in creation, um, you know, let us, it should just burst forth into us, you know, burst forth from us uh, into worship, uh, in song, in adoration, in just glorifying God and giving him all the praise and uh, glory. Okay, so when we do that, uh, you know, we're not just engaging in some academic exercise, but it's just actually getting us uh, more into a closer relationship with God, uh, just falling in love with his uh, His. Um, person uh, with what he has done with who he is and giving him all the glory and honor and praise because God deserves that he desires that and he is pleased um, with that so all of what we are uh, studying uh, I would request you to even as you're listening you know just in your heart just to rejoice just to celebrate uh, who God is uh, just to worship him okay so this is uh, uh, chapter three where we looked at um, 
Jesus Christ, uh, his role in creation, uh, thus proving, you know, uh, that he is um, deity, that he is God, um, because um, all things were created um, uh, by him, through him, created for him, and in him all things uh, are sustained, all things have life without him, there is no life, there is no sustenance, uh, we are just nothing, okay? That is end of chapter 3. Anyone has any comments, any thoughts you want to share? Any doubts? I hope you're at least taking some time off to, I know all of you have run busy schedules, but uh, it's important for you all to go through your notes um, so that, you know, you'll, uh, if you have any doubts to ask. Or you have yeah. can, I, can I ask this one? Sure. Yeah. In the story of creation in Genesis, uh, God said, let us, he said, us, let us make man. Yeah. This that statement has any bearing on the pre-existence of uh, Jesus? Yes, it does. Because so uh, we said that, you know, uh, Jesus did not come, uh, uh, his existence was not at one particular time in his history. Um, he is before all time. Uh, he existed even before the foundations of the world. And um, he was there uh, at creation, uh, you know, uh, just giving out the command. So yes, it proves, does prove the pre-existence of Christ. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Anything that really stood out for you in these three chapters? Anything new that you learned? Anything that really struck you? which you did not know you'd like to share? No? Okay, if not, we'll uh, move on. Um, so in chapters 1 to 3, we basically studied about uh, the deity of Jesus Christ, that we established the fact that Jesus is God by studying verses in the Bible, which points to his pre-existence, to his equality with the Father and the God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and his role in creation. And hence, we established the fact that Jesus is um, God uh, and now we'll move on to chapter 4. In uh, chapter 4 and the subsequent chapters, we will examine the humanity of Christ. So we looked at his deity, that then we established the fact that he is God. Now we'll move on to see the humanity of Christ, that he is fully man as well. Okay, and that is what we look in chapter 4 and the subsequent uh, uh, chapters. Okay, so before we look at chapter 4, any questions, any doubts about the deity of Christ, that he is God? As for me, no. <laughs> okay. Okay, you didn't say as for me and my house. <laughs> okay, it's for you, thank you. Just joking. Okay. Okay, if there's no questions, then we'll move on to chapter four, where we uh, will look at, um, uh, you know, a few Old Testament uh, prophecies, uh, important Old Testament prophecies that foretell the coming of Christ um, as the as in incarnation, uh, Christ as the incarnate one, that means God taking on human form. So we look at important Old Testament prophecies that talk about the incarnation of Christ. When we're talking about the incarnation of Christ, it means God taking on human form. Okay. Now there are several Old Testament prophecies, uh, prophecies uh, uh, that also relate to various aspects of Christ's work, which we'll be studying in um, the subsequent uh, chapters. But for now, we look at just few important prophecies in the Old Testament 
uh, that point to the incarnation of uh, Christ. Now, before we look at these old, important Old Testament prophecies, there are a few important facts um, that we can we need to understand or grasp or take hold of. Uh, the first thing is that the incarnation, that is the coming of Jesus Christ, was foretold many hundreds of years before it actually happened. Uh, so we know that incarnation was an event that was planned in the mind of God in the ages past. Okay, not just at the beginning of time, not just when Adam and Eve sinned and God said, oh, oh, uh, you know, what do we do now? Adam and Eve have sinned. My you know, plan has gone haywire. So what should I do? No, you know, it was not then that he thought about plan B or how to redeem mankind. But it says that even before the foundations of the world, it says that, you know, um, uh, it was this plan was already, this idea was already in the mind of God um, uh, to send uh, the Lamb of God, to send his son. And in the mind of God, it was already uh, the, the finished work of Jesus on the cross was already a done and completed thing in the mind of God. That is even before the foundations of the uh, world. So it was an event that was planned even before, um, you know, uh, the foundations of the world, the ages past means even before the foundations of the um, world. And uh, how do we know that, you know, this, uh, the plan of Jesus coming on the cross, uh, Jesus coming to the earth, and um, uh, him dying on the cross, the full plan of redemption was already conceived in the mind of God. It was a done thing. It was a completed thing, even before the foundations of the world. We read this in First Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. An important verse. I would like somebody to read that, please. First Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. Anyone reading First Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and 20? Yes, ma'am. Thank but you. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Yeah, thank you. So here we see Peter writing and saying that, you know, that... Um, the lamb without blemish, that is Jesus Christ, uh, you know, uh, the whole plan of salvation was foreordained even before the foundation of the world, but it was manifested, which means it was revealed to us in a time like this, okay, uh, in as a specific or particular point in history. But before it was revealed, before it was completed in the natural, it was already a plan that was in the mind of God. It was conceived in the plan of God mind of God, it was also done a completed thing in the mind of God, even before the foundations of the world. Okay, so that is the first important fact that we need to take hold of. The second one was the Jewish people look forward or anticipated the coming of the Messiah. Okay, Messiah, Christ, Christos, the Greek word, uh, anointed one. And uh, they were looking for the Messiah who was, what kind of Messiah were they looking for? Anyone has any idea? The Jews were looking for what kind of a Messiah? The Messiah that will rule over them in terms of government. Okay. They were looking for a, a, a Messiah who would be a triumphant a king. Uh, who would come and deliver the Jewish people from slavery, from bondage, from those who are oppressing them. Basically, they were under the Roman rule. They were really fed up with this, uh, the Roman rule. Uh, and they were looking for freedom and they were anticipating or looking forward for this promised Messiah. And they were looking for this triumphant king. Uh, somebody would come as a liberator, a redeemer, who redeemed them from political 
uh, you know, slavery uh, uh, rulership and would uh, rule and govern them and bring peace and uh, freedom uh, for the Jews. And they were not in any way looking for uh, a, a Messiah who would, uh, you know, would be the slam, who would make the sacrifice, who would die on the cross. So for basically for uh, the Jews, they were looking for somebody who would uh, deliver them from slavery and from uh, subjection of uh, government or political uh, rule. Okay, And they did not expect the Messiah to come to be crucified as a Lamb of God, but they were looking for somebody who was a triumphant king and a liberator. Okay, so these are uh, some uh, two important facts that we need to keep in mind, even as uh, we look at um, the Old Testament prophecies regarding uh, the incarnation of Christ. Okay, so let's look at uh, a, a few important Old Testament prophecies. The first one is in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. Can somebody read Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, please? Genesis, Genesis chapter 3 verse. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, Ziatoli can go ahead. Yeah. Genesis 3 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay. So here this is uh, the curse that is uh, Jesus God is pronouncing um, over the serpent, um, you know, after Adam and Eve uh, sinned. And this um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 uh, you know, it's talking about the promise uh, of the seed, the coming of the Messiah who would crush the head of the uh, serpent. Uh, it's referred to as the proto-evangel, which means it's the first messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. Okay, so this verse um, 15 in Genesis chapter 3 is referred to as the proto-evangel which means uh, the first evangelistic message, okay, the first messianic prophecy, the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament. It's also referred to as the Edenic covenant. Okay, covenant means a promise that God makes uh, with man. So it's uh, uh, referred to as the Edenic covenant. And this is the basis for development of all redemptive covenants. That means all the other covenants, uh, you know, based on redemption, redeeming mankind from sin to salvation. Uh, this uh, was the Edenic covenant in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is the basis for the development of all other redemptive um, covenants. Now, before we understand more about this verse, we will look at this verse because this verse is written in a very uh, figurative sense. That means um, one thing is said in the form of a figure of an other. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Now here, uh, the serpent, serpent is uh, representative of who? Who does a serpent represent here? Does it really represent a snake or a serpent? The devourer of Satan. Yes, the it evil is. One. Uh, yes, thank you, Lubega. So here, serpent is referred to as the devil, Satan, the evil one. Uh, we read this about this in Revelation chapter twelve, verse nine as well. Now, the woman here is representative of whom? The woman. It says, I, in verse in verse fifteen, it says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. So woman is talking here about whom? It basically I means think, he, Yes, go ahead. I, I think the one who born the deliverer. Okay. Thank you. 
the woman here is representative of the entire human race okay so god is saying that i will put enmity between you and the woman basically is me i put enmity between you devil serpent uh, uh, devil satan and between you and the entire human race okay and the phrase her seed now if you if you look at uh, i would like all of you to look at this verse 15 in genesis chapter 3 um there are two were that uh, two times seed is mentioned here right in verse 15 yes no did you spot that yes ma'am yes okay now what's the difference between these the, the two seeds that are mentioned here in verse 15 is there a difference ma'am there's a capital s and there's a small s Thank you, uh, Rosalind. So there is a small s and there is a capital S. So it says, I will, uh, God says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman that is rest of mankind and, be and uh, between your seed. So they are the small, uh, the seed with a small s is referring to whom? The followers of Satan. Followers of Satan. Thank you, Lubega. This, those who were the devils or the we can't hear you, Lubega. Okay, anyone else? Who do you think is representing this uh, seed with the smallest Between woman, uh, uh, I put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. The smallest is Satan. Okay. Okay, between your seed uh, and her seed is, yes, as son is those who are living in sin. Okay, those who are under slavery to mankind. It's basically all of human race because when Adam and Eve sinned, we all came under uh, Satan, under his uh, slavery, under his subjection. And her seed, the capital S there, is talking about whom? The, cap the seed with the capital S. Jesus Christ. Thank you. It's G Jesus um, Christ. Okay. So here we see that uh, uh, the seed could represent the people uh, the people of God, whom now are under slavery to Satan, and uh, it can also mean uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, so it, the word seed can uh, refer to or can be understood either as singular or it can be uh, understood as plural, plural because the you know, people of God, uh, uh, singular because it's referring to uh, Jesus Christ. So, also the word he, his could also uh, be. Uh, referred to as singular and plural. So if it's plural, it could stand for it or they, because it's basically representing, uh, you know, um, uh, people of God or a single person that is uh, Jesus Christ. Okay. And we also see uh, the word here, um, head. Okay. Uh, uh, it says, um, he shall bruise your head, the capital H. He is referring to God. He shall bruise your head. Is uh, who's the head? Head is not talking about head, where you you know uh, the part of your human body. It's talking about the word head here in Hebrew is rosh. The the Hebrew word is rosh, which means uh, supreme. Uh, a leader, a chief, a prince, and so it's basically referring to Satan, okay? So the term head here is basically referring to the Hebrew word Rosh, which means supreme prince, leader, uh, chief, uh, and it's specifically referring to Satan, okay? We'll stop here, we'll take a break, and then um, we'll join class again, okay?